Father God, it is our privilege to know that you are here with us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. And we just ask that you would soften our hearts towards the word that you have for us this morning. Father, take words and breathe life onto them. Create something that will impact us and give us an opportunity to think and reflect about who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, As I was preparing for this uh, message, I became quite reflective, almost nostalgic. And I remember when we started here at Liberty Church, that's over 10 years ago now, and we had $294.49 in the bank. And we were also given some pledges to honour. $500 had been raised to support a family with a high-needs daughter. $820 had been donated to renovate the kitchen. There were many things that were positive. We had a debt-free building, but a new pastor who, let's face it, is a middle-aged woman. This is not what people were used to, and soon our attendance was regularly at just four or five. But our call was to faithfulness, to rebuild and to keep the doors open. And I remember being so excited when we had reached double figures, 10 people. It was so exciting. You may have heard me talk about how one of the very first things I wanted to do was to replace the mailbox. The old one was falling off its perch. It was rusty and drab and sad. And it seemed hard to spend money on a mailbox when there were so many needs. We were committed to excellence um, and a mailbox seemed a very tangible way in which to start this journey. There is a recognised margin of time to see things through fresh eyes when you start a new position. And I started and I could see a lot of things. I saw a lot of needs. I saw a lot of lack. And it felt like we had nothing to work with. Around that time, I heard a message about Elijah being brought provision by the ravens. Remember that story? Elijah was by the brook and the ravens brought provision to him. And I remember crying out to God, God, show me your ravens. Show me that they're on their way. We need your provision to come in supernatural ways if we are ever going to accomplish what you have set us to do here. Where are your ravens? God didn't show me any ravens, but the Holy Spirit gave me a picture from the life of Elisha in which we are going to look at today. The prophet Elisha was a prophet who had spiritual sight And he could see what other people could not see. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit gave me a glimpse of that. And I could feel the pressure lift. It was going to be okay. God would provide. Last week, we saw how Elisha gave advice to three kings when their armies ended up in the desert without water. Elisha saw provision and victory, and he gave them instructions to dig ditches in the desert. Those ditches silently filled with water overnight. The Moabites saw the water shine red and made assumptions that they lost them the battle. So the story today comes from 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 1. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to you, her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said except a little oil. 
This is a story of a widow who has suffered tragedy. Her husband has died. She's left without resource or recourse in a culture that is difficult for the unprotected. In spite of Levitical law, they had no personal legal standing and identity outside their husband. This is a lot of women in this era. Widows could go and live with their father's house again, but there is no mention of parents here. She is alone. Her husband was a godly man, part of the company of prophets, yet for whatever reason, he died leaving a lot of debt, a lot of debt. We are not given why the debt is there, whether it was from some reasonable explanation from, say, medical bills or something that we might judge as unreasonable, like gambling debts. This tells me that the why is not so important. What is important is that in this situation, this woman feels abandoned in this problem. And this problem is time sensitive. She is on a deadline. Now the debt collectors were of the opinion that without a working member of the family, the only way they would get their money back was to claim her young sons as slaves to repay what it was owing. This is what the law of Moses has to say about slavery as a way of dealing with debt. And we find that in Leviticus 25. From verse 39, it says, If one of your countrymen becomes poor among you and sells himself to you, do not make him work as a slave. He is to be treated as a hired worker or a temporary resident among you. He is to work for you until the year of Jubilee. Then he and his children are to be released and he will go back to his own clan and to the property of his forefathers. Because the Israelites are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt, they must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. God created us to live free lives. Slavery in any form is not part of the plan. God invested greatly so we could live free lives. So he does not take lightly to those things that would bring us under bondage again. Here in Israel, these creditors are not operating under the supreme law that is just. They do not know or revere the covenant of Moses. They are operating on their own cultural marketplace sort of law. In Israel at this time, this is what was done to redeem debts. But this is not according to the law of God. God's principles laid out in Scripture have been applied to support and honour humanity and esteem worth across generations. Slavery is not one of those ways. They have given this woman an ultimatum. That means her sons will be taken into slavery even though they were sons of a prophet. This story is different to the story we looked at last week, The Ditches in the Desert, where King Joram found himself in a predicament because of his own choices. He blamed God for the consequences of his own decisions and expected God to fix the problem with an air of entitlement. This situation, this is not her fault but that doesn't make it any less distressing. Even if this problem might not be an outcome of this widow's own poor, poor management, it's real nonetheless. This situation is happening to her family. And even if it's not her fault, she has to deal with it. Notice that this story is not just a story of provision. First and foremost, it is a story of redemption. It's a story of redeeming freedom. This woman has to find a way to save her sons. She knows that if she doesn't, it's the end of her family, possibly the end of her son's lives, possibly the end of her own life. She is desperate and this desperation makes her bold. I don't for a moment suspect that Elisha was her first and only port. 
that she stopped at to ask or plead for help. Yet it seems over and over people had seen her problem as too big, they had written her off and had condemned her sons to inevitable slavery. I can hear the desperation in her voice. She's got to the point where she's out of options and yet somewhere there is still a mustard seed of faith and hope that there must be a way out. Notice that she just doesn't know what it is yet, but she keeps asking. Surely someone somewhere will know what to do. Her husband belonged to a company of prophets. A company is not just two or three people. This speaks of a significant community, but they are unable to help. It is this contact that also gives her access to Elisha. Perhaps she had heard of the story of the ditches in the desert. Perhaps she had heard of the great prophet of Elijah before him. Perhaps she knew Elisha had poured water on Elijah's hands. All she knows is that perhaps this is her way of accessing help. She is a woman who is humble enough to ask for help again. And she boldly goes to him pleading for help. This situation is so desperate that without the intervention from God, they are done. It seems she was so desperate that Elisha would hear her story and her plight and she believed that he would provide a solution. Perhaps she also hopes there was enough good in her husband's life to outweigh the poor, even though she is one of the little people. That confidence, in spite of her desperate desperation, means that she believes God would be willing to hear her story and provide a solution. She has faith in the grace of God. There's no fear of condemnation regarding poor financial management. There's no fear of being dismissed because she has no legal or social standing or recourse. It is like she realises that with God... There are not big or little people, just people. Normally, this woman would not have been heard, but God was willing and he generously and graciously becomes part of her story. She truly believes God is willing to intervene even though he has nothing to work with. Her faith in the grace of Elisha is not misplaced. When she goes to Elisha, He doesn't respond by berating her poor financial choices. There's no dismissing her because she has no standing or legal recourse. Elisha simply asks what she has. He knows that God works with resources that we already have. And her answer, the way she responds is, I've got nothing, nothing at all. She was destitute in the fullest sense of the meaning. And then almost just as an afterthought, she adds, oh, a little, a very little bit of oil. Not much, very little, a small amount. And that is enough. God invites us to dedicate and to offer to him our small, our little bit. That's what he works with. So let's see how Elisha responds. Verse 3, Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbours for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars. As each one is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. And when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. I like that in this story, this woman saw the possibility of what Elisha saw. To allow that possibility, that equals faith. 
Elisha specifically said to her, don't just ask for a few jars, go big. Would that make sense? No. She, all she has is a near empty jug of oil, yet she steps out and believes in the possibility of what Elisha saw. Elisha saw a miracle of provision that hasn't happened yet, and she was able to see that possibility as well. Another thing I notice is that Elisha didn't ride in on a white steed and take over and do it all himself. He didn't rescue her and her boys by sweeping them off their feet and solving this for her. The woman had to participate in her own miracle. She had to do something. She had to work at it. And she was willing. Once she knew what to do, she got in and she did it without hesitation. Many of the miracles of Elisha come with the theme of how God invites his people to participate in their own miracles. King Joram's army had as much water according to the number of ditches that they dug. They had to dig the ditches. Elisha didn't go and do that for them. In this situation, as much as the widow was willing to invest and prepare, that was the size of her miracle. This widow could get as much oil as the jars she collected. This woman had to act. She had to go out and get the jars. She had to ask. She had to go to the neighbours and knock on the door. She had to humbly ask again for help, a specific request. Can I borrow your jars, your jugs and your saucepans? And then she had to pour. What she already had was multiplied. What she thought was a sign of nothing became her sign of God's generosity. Sometimes God will start with nothing and speak a word of creation. In the beginning, God created. But more often, God uses the small that we already have available and then he blesses and multiplies and invigorates that offering to become something more. Think of the loaves and the fishes. Jesus took a child's lunch and fed a crowd of thousands twice. He turned water into wine. He saved a wedding's host from embarrassment and provided excellent wine from large large pitchers of ceremonial water. Sandals on the feet of the Israelites. Those who were nomads in the desert found that their sandals did not wear out even after a generation of travelling from place to place through the desert. A small bowl of meal flour... A small quantity of flour fed Elijah and a Gentile widow and her son during a three and a half year famine. This woman, this widow, saw her small quantity of oil blessed and multiplied. This was her provision. So in verse 7, we read this. She went and told the man of God and said, and he said to her, go, go. Sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Her participation is not over. Now she had to go and sell what had been collected. She had to sell enough oil to redeem her debts and her son's freedom. Did you notice that there was not just enough? There was surplus. There was enough to ensure her debts were paid and her son's lives were safe. But there was also surplus, supernatural superannuation surplus for herself and for her sons until they were old enough to work and generate their own income. So how did this woman start to see what Elijah saw? How did she go from having nothing in her house, nothing at all, to experiencing plenty. Remember when I asked God to show me the ravens, that I needed to see the provision of God coming to us in what felt like was a famine. I seriously could not see how we could do what God has asked us to do and what he'd called us to do without any resources. 
God did hear my cry and he did answer my question, but in a very different way to what I expected. The Holy Spirit showed me this story of the woman, the widow with the pitcher of oil. And she showed, and he showed me that this woman, if she had looked up into that jug as she was pouring out the oil, that jug would have always appeared empty. It would not have seemed like there was ever enough. It would not have appeared to be even remotely sufficient. It would have always looked like it was about to run out. She would have not seen plenty. She would have only seen lack. How easy it would have been to be sceptical that the oil could go the distance. Yet by faith, She did not analyse the contents of the jug. She just never stopped pouring. She kept filling the next vessel, the next jar, the next pitcher, the next bottle, the next bowl, whatever she had on hand. And as she did that, not by looking into the jug, but just by pouring out in faith, keep pouring out in faith, staying focused on the task at hand because God had promised provision. Can you imagine how amazing it would have been for this woman as her sons raised their eyes from their task when that last jar had been filled and they would have looked up and gazed back over their little house to see what was stacked on the kitchen bench and what was stacked in the living room and on the bedrooms, all the jars and the vessels and the pitchers and the bottles that were filled with oil from that little apparently empty jug. It was in that moment that they could see the miraculous, generous, impossible provision of plenty. When we look back, we can see the provision of God. Loaves and fishes, 12 baskets left over, collected, water into wine. It was the most excellent wine served at the close of a wedding. Men are in the desert feeding an emerging nation as they travel through the wilderness. Sandals on the feet of thousands of Israelites for over 40 years of travel and not one worn sole or broken strap. A small bowl of meal fowl fed a family of three for the duration of a a three-and-a-half-year famine. Looking back, we can see the generous, impossible provision of God. That's a wonderful story, such an encouragement, such a reminder for us to not necessarily analyse the contents of the jug, but just to keep pouring out. So let's take a moment and pause and reflect on this story of Elisha as he connected with this widow, saving her sons from slavery. What are the slave drivers that are knocking on my door? Where do I go when I feel impossibly stuck? Am I willing to look at what I have rather than what I don't have? What small resources can I bring to God? Am I willing to keep pouring out in faith without being sceptical? What are the jars on my kitchen bench? Where do I see the generous, impossible provision of God? Am I listening to God's invitation to see my situation differently? How can I participate with God for my freedom and provision? That picture that God gave me back when I asked for ravens was of that woman holding her near-empty jug of oil. It was that the jug was always nearly empty. The jug never filled up, but she kept pouring anyway. And in this, she filled a house full of jars to the brim. And I think it's a worthy exercise for us occasionally to pause and to look up and to look back over the kitchen benches and to actually acknowledge the provision of God. What are the jars that are sitting on our kitchen bench that declare the miraculous provision of God? What about those jars on the benches here at Liberty Church? 
When we look at the weekly budget, sometimes it can seem like the jug is nearly empty. But God was reassuring me that he is a God who uses what we have to resource us to do what he has called us to do. So what does our kitchen bench look like in the 10 years we've been here? What are the jars that we've been able to fill? I made a bit of a list of the jars that have been filled as we steward the oil in our jug here at Liberty Church. This is a long way from that first item on the list, a mailbox. This is not a comprehensive list, but it gives us an idea. These are some of the jars on the kitchen table as we start pouring out responsibly and faithfully. A little jug started with not quite $300 in the bank. Some of these jars are small and don't look that impressive, but each one is another jar on the bench. Our kitchen renovation already had some money put towards that, so this was our first major project. So fitting, because we love our church part two. Replacing the screws on the roof after a cyclone, that was a $3,000 bill. Paying solicitors to complete a legal restructure, that's a $7,000 bill. Replacing the carpet was also a $7,000 endeavour. Installing air cons, what a difference that's made. And in all of this, we've been able to save and still put money aside for our extension in a ministry room. And there's still more to do. God doesn't give a vision or a mission Declare freedom over our lives. We're called Liberty Church. He doesn't do that without resourcing it. All of these jars are what I call extras. These are not operational costs of council rates or insurances or church dues, power and water and ministry. And yet we've been keeping out pouring. Keep on pouring, knowing that our God is the God of provision because he is behind the oil in the jug. God has declared his intention and grace to resource his vision. And looking back, we have many, many jars on the kitchen bench. We have an invitation to partner with God and to participate in his provision. We can see the miraculous, generous, impossible provision of plenty. God will use what we have, even the small and the little bits, and he will use that to his glory to make it go much further than anyone ever thought was possible. And we can join with Elisha and the widow with her sons and look up with amazement at the number of jars of oil on our kitchen bench. In this story, Elisha is not consulted by three kings, but a widow, a nobody, someone people were ignoring or who had already written off. She is destitute and desperate, and she seeks Elisha out because she has nowhere else to go, living with the consequences of a situation that was not her own making. God wants us to walk in liberty and freedom. And he does not take lightly to those things that would bring us under bondage again. This is a story about restoring freedom and the provision needed to secure that. And Elisha sees provision where the widow could only see lack. Yet she gets to participate in the solution and she gets her miracle of provision. Supernatural intervention changes a house of empty vessels into a house full of jars brimming with oil. God invites us also to participate in our own miracles of provision. And we start by seeing what Elisha saw. Not lack, not nothing, but what is available and what is in our hand. What is our little bit of oil? A little is all that is needed. The encouragement that I have when I read this story is to think of this. We have as much oil as the number of jars that we collect. If we have as much oil for as long as we keep pouring out, God is graciously providing oil and resources even when we feel like our jug is empty. We need to participate with him for lasting and enduring results so that we can contain 
and retain the freedom that he has already bought for us. Let's pray. Father God, how incredible that you would take a little oil in a jug and create such immense, generous provision. We're so grateful, Father, that you've replicated that same miracle in this house. You've taken a little bit of money and you've made it go so, so far. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you have given us a promise that you're resourcing the vision that you have given over this house. Father, we pray that we would steward diligently that mantle that you've given us to be a house of liberty and a house of freedom. We thank you that you're doing the same things in our own personal lives. We thank you, Father, that you take what we offer to you, our little bit of little, and you make it go so far. Father, we pray that we would be faithful in using our little bit to further the kingdom of God and not our own silos and kingdoms. But, Father, that we would partner with you and what you're already doing, that we would faithfully steward those things for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.